from Leviticus chapter 19. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice, you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And from Matthew chapter 22, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. May God bless the hearing and the living of this word. And further reading from the writings. From Secrets of Heaven, number 2023. The divine presence among people who believe in the Lord is love and charity. Love means love for the Lord. Charity means love for our neighbor. Love for the Lord cannot possibly be separated from love for our neighbor because the Lord's own love goes out to the entire human race. He wants to save all of us forever and to attach us tightly to himself so that not one of us will perish. So anyone who loves the Lord has the Lord's own love and consequently cannot help loving others. And from Divine Providence, number 94, the Lord's union with us and our mutual union with the Lord are accomplished through our loving our neighbor as ourselves and loving the Lord above all. Loving our neighbor as ourselves is simply not dealing dishonestly or unfairly with people, not harboring hatred or burning with revenge against them, not speaking ill of them or slandering them. People who do not do such things because they are both bad for their neighbor and sins against God treat their neighbor honestly, fairly, cordially, and faithfully. Since the Lord acts in the same way, a mutual union results. When there is a mutual union, then whatever we do for our neighbor, we do from the Lord. And whatever we do from the Lord is good. Amen. Good morning, and welcome to the children's message. So we just heard about the two great commandments right? Love the Lord and love your neighbor. So what does that mean? Basically, be nice to people, right? That's sort of, you can sum it up that way, because it's kind of great. This is kind of a two-for-one deal. If you're loving your neighbor, you are loving the Lord. And if you love the Lord, you will automatically love your neighbor. That's great. Great. Good. Amen. We can all go have snacks. Except, have you ever been in a bad mood? I have. Anybody else? Have you ever been in such a bad mood that you can't be nice to people? Now it seems like, okay, so every time I'm in a bad mood, I am now breaking the two great commandments. I mean, they're the two great commandments. That sounds like a big deal to break the two great commandments. Fortunately, there's a way to follow the two great commandments even when you're in a bad mood. All right, listen carefully. This is the tricky trick. You can still be loving the neighbor and loving the Lord when you're in a bad mood so long as you ask for help. If 
You don't have happiness and love and joy in your own heart. You can't give it away, right? So say you want to eat tacos. First, you have to have tacos to eat, right? You're going to have to go buy them or make them, right? It's like you can't eat them till you have them. You can't love other people until you have love in your heart. But how do you get that love back in your heart, right? You go to someone you love and trust, and you tell them how you feel. I'm sad. I'm scared. I'm angry. I'm hurt. Please help. So that's the good news. You don't have to be in a good mood all the time, but you can still be following the two great commandments all the time, so long as you're willing to ask for help. Amen. Thank you, my guinea pigs, for being here with me today, helping me learn to be a pastor and a minister and a preacher. But I, I kind of gave the sermon just now. We really could all go have snacks. I, you can dig really deep into these passages that we read. You can. You can spend hours studying them. And they are as simple as they sound. If you're loving the Lord, you will be loving the neighbor. If you're loving your neighbor, that is loving the Lord. Great. Best two-for-one deal ever. I don't know about you, but I often get in my head way too much about it, thinking that it, it can't be that simple, it can't be that easy, especially if I am trying to be a good citizen of the world and I'm reading the news. It's kind of bleak. In fact, the news is usually the bad news, right? That's usually what we see in the headlines, is what's wrong with the world today? So then I go, okay, how about I just look at national news? That'll be less to take up. Nope, still bad. Still bad, still hard, still frustrating and scary. How about local news? Local news should be fine, right? Nope, nope. Still sad, still hard. And I feel this sense that if I'm loving my neighbor, I should be helping fix these problems. And suddenly I'm exhausted and I'm overwhelmed and very quickly pretty depressed. And now not only am I not fixing the world, as if I could, I'm not even doing the dishes or taking a shower or showing up for my kids when they're upset. Sometimes loving the neighbor looks an awful lot like self-care. That's weird for me. I don't know about for you, but it's a relatively new thing to encounter the concept that the following list in no particular order actually can fall under the heading of self-care. All right? Getting a good night's sleep. Doing the laundry. Washing the dishes. Brushing my teeth. How is that love for the neighbor? Well, because then I don't have bad breath. If I get a good night's sleep, then I get up on time, then I leave for work on time, then as I'm driving, I'm not stressed out and hanging on to the wheel for dear life and cutting people off in traffic. No, instead, I'm relaxed and I'm calm and I can peacefully drive to work, enjoying my commute. And then when I get to work, I'm calm and peaceful so that if other people are having a distressed day, I can be like, it's okay, welcome, how can I help? So it is, it's love to the neighbor to get a good night's sleep because that leads to a lovely interaction in my workplace. We fall into a trap, I think, very easily of thinking that little actions aren't big enough. For a little while, I worked as a cashier at a grocery store. And as people came up with their piles of groceries, I would say, how are you? And very often it was just, I'm fine, I'm fine. Let's, let's get this checked out thing done. But more often than you might think, someone would go, actually, I'm feeling sad. I just lost my sister. Or my family is coming to town. I'm so excited they would share genuinely from their heart how they were doing right in that moment. And it was such a gift to be able to turn to them and go either celebrate with them or grieve with them. It was such a gift for me 
to be able to turn to someone who just told me a tragedy and say, I'm so sorry. I lost my mom when I was young. I know how that feels. And it made both of us lighter. Love to the neighbor doesn't have to be big and showy. In fact, for most of us sitting in here, it's never going to be big and showy. It's going to be the little things. But we need to not underestimate those little things because we never know the ripple effect that that's having, right? So a person in maybe a, a really sad mood came to the grocery store and I checked them out and as I checked them out, hopefully I rang up their groceries correctly, but in the meantime, we talked and as they left, maybe they felt a little lighter. Maybe that meant that when they went home that night, they could prepare dinner for their family with love and lightness in their heart. Maybe that made it a little easier to make dinner. Maybe that meant that as their family sat around the dinner table, they could have a beautiful heart-to-heart -heart conversation rather than sit sullenly in silence or maybe even argue with each other. These are little tiny gifts we give each other. And they do exactly what these readings were telling us, that the Lord's love is flowing into all of us all the time. And to follow these two great commandments, all we have to do is share. But we're not always the ones giving, right? Sometimes we're the ones receiving. Sometimes we're the one that is low. Sometimes I'm the one that's depressed and I need to go to somebody and say, I'm not okay and I need help. And I'm not failing to follow the two great commandments if I need help. Failing to follow the two great commandments would be refusing help if it's offered or not asking for help when I know I need it. And boy, I've been guilty of that. I don't know about you. There are times that I get mad and then I get like kind of snotty. So somebody can, who knows me well will be like, Tira's not okay. And they'll come and go, Tira, are you okay? And I'll be like, I'm fine. I'm not fine. I'm not fine at all. And by refusing to engage, by refusing to say, yeah, I'm not, I'm not okay. Can I talk? Can you help? If I shut them off and I don't accept their help, that is breaking the two great, two great commandments. That's shutting off the flow of the Lord's love. Following the two great commandments can even look actually pretty confrontational. Sometimes the two great commandments if I'm overloaded, overwhelmed, and I'm not going to be able to accomplish important things that need to get done, following the two great commandments can be standing my ground and going, no, I can't. This is what I can do. I can't do more, so no. And sometimes people don't like that answer, right? I'm a mom. I spend a lot of time taking care of my family, taking care of my kids, doing the things that other people in the house didn't notice needed to get done, but that really needed to get done. And sometimes I can't do those things. Sometimes I'm sick, or I'm depressed, or I'm just busy. And then people suddenly notice that things didn't get done, right? The dishes are piled extra high, or whatever. And rather than go, oh no, I'm a failure, I'm not loving my neighbor, I didn't do all these invisible tasks that my family doesn't usually notice. And now they notice. Nope, actually loving the neighbor in that moment can be going, yeah, you know what? How about you guys wash some dishes? That's still loving the neighbor, even if I'm being firm, even if I'm being a little confrontational. That part in Leviticus, right? It said, call out your neighbors or you're guilty too. It doesn't let us off the hook. It's all there if we look for it. So the challenge that I present all of us this week, as we take, hopefully we take these into our lives and live these teachings, right? Here's the challenge for us this week. Don't underestimate the little kindnesses. They're a bigger deal than you think. And be willing to ask for help when you need it. Amen.